Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Lutheran Church of the Risen Savior on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, where our focus is on Christ our Lord. Our focus should always be on Christ our Lord and all that he has done for us and uh, saving us for all eternity. And it should also be on our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. A few announcements. Uh, today is the day for the Felix Hall con uh, organ concert uh, that we've all been waiting for. That's today at 3 p.m. And we've been encouraging you to bring your friends to see a world-class organist on a world-class organ today. And what a great opportunity for us. Uh, again, registration for our 50th anniversary celebration event is open. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex, and you can also do it online via the link on your e-connections on Monday mornings. Uh, there, um, there has been a uh, generous donation given that's covering most of the cost of the dinner for us. We are still uh, accepting any donations that you might want to give to cover some of the other expenses besides the food uh, for that uh, big event. You'll have to register individually if there's two or three going in your group. Uh, you each have to register individually because you get your choice of uh, entree and dessert. And uh, so uh, uh, please remember that each individual will have to register uh, for that. Uh, there are memorial services planned. Uh, Becky Gray's memorial service will be on Saturday, February 3rd. That's this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. And the uh, memorial service for John Levi uh, will be on Saturday, February 10th. I think that information's in your worship folder, but I just wanted to let you know that those have been scheduled. Uh, also, there'll be another fused glass workshop in February. Um, you can see the worship folder for details on that as well. So do please check your worship folder for all the meetings and Bible studies and activities uh, that will be going on here in the coming days and weeks. It's a busy place. Our uh, order of worship today is the divine service setting number four. We'll be doing the gospel acclamation before and after the gospel again. And our closing song, uh, there'll be a part for the choir and for the men and for the women of the congregation. And you can just follow along on the screen to know which stanza uh, that you should be singing. Our theme today is Christoskepsis. And that might need some explanation. I'll do that in the uh, message today. It means gazing upon Jesus. And uh, we will prayerfully... Uh, prepare for worship now during the prelude.
Our hymn of invocation is hymn number 839, O Christ, our true and only light, and let us worship the Lord. stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright in the congregation. Splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his words in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and kindness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers, 
that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the word of God. shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb. On the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up from them for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name and that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord.
The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for, for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother from whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere and throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. 
This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now we confess before God and one another our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing this uh, hymn of the day, Where Charity and Love Prevail, hymn 845. <laughs>
We begin with a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the message is our epistle reading uh, for this day from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Friends in Christ Jesus. I ran into a new word not long ago, and I love it. I couldn't wait to use it in a sermon, though it's a little bit hard to say. The word is omphaloskepsis. Omphaloskepsis. Its origins are Greek. Skepsis in Greek is the practice of gazing at or looking upon something for a long time. And amphalos? Well, that's your belly button. If one engages in amphaloskepsis, that would make you an amphaloskeptic, and you are engaged in the practice of gazing at your own belly button meaning that you are concerned with only your own needs. Your focus in life is first and foremost me, myself, and I. Yes, we have our own word in English, but omphaloskepsis is simply a fancy way to say that word, navel-gazer. It's just more fun to say omphaloskepsis. So... What the Apostle Paul is addressing in our epistle text today are those who are concerned only with themselves, the Amphalo skeptics of the world. They're not concerned about their brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the lesson that we can take away from this discussion about how the first century Christian church in Corinth dealt with struggles about what to do with regard to the Old Testament Jewish dietary laws, and in this case especially, food that had been sacrificed to false idols. So what was really going on in first century Corinth? Well, there were, it seems, cafeteria-like facilities that were attached to pagan temples. They would serve meat from animals that had been offered as sacrifices to those idols in the temple. Some Corinthian Christians, who were confident that there is only one true God, had no problems with eating in such places. They knew that these false idols were just statues and were not at all gods. So what's the harm, they thought? They most likely assumed that Paul, being a one-God kind of guy, would approve of their eating this food sacrificed to false idols because they were just that. They were not real gods. No harm, no foul, right? Well, there were some Corinthian Christians maybe those more recently introduced to Jesus, that connected the idol worship with the eating of the meat and were offended that some would actually eat the meat that had been offered to other people's gods. Or maybe they would think to themselves, if it's okay to eat the meat sacrificed to idols, maybe I too should go in there and worship those idols. Their faith in Jesus could potentially be destroyed, to use Paul's own word. That is, they could be drawn back into paganism. And the Apostle Paul did not want that to happen. He would hope that those who were stronger in the faith, who were thinking only of themselves, would think also of their brothers, those newer and weaker in the faith. This is how Paul himself writes it in his letter to the Corinthians. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. 
For although there were many so-called gods in heaven and earth, and indeed there are many gods and many lords among the people, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, he continues, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through their former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees that you, having knowledge, eating in the idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The bro this brother in Christ, for whom, he di for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. And then Paul concludes for himself, and I believe suggesting this course of action for others, if food makes your brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So, how does this apply to us in Green Valley, USA in 2024 A.D.? I'm quite certain that none of you are sending emails to your pastor or writing the Commission on Theology and Church Relations at our synodical office saying, concerning foods offered to idols, what should I do? So, what are some of the analogous circumstances in this day? Well, what about a, a bumper sticker right next to your Christian ichthus fish touting the NRA? or the ACLU, or your favorite presidential candidate? Would some of our Christian brothers and sisters be offended? Of course we can have our opinions, and of course we must stand strong for the truth of God's Word, uh, those that are non-negotiable, but wouldn't, we wouldn't want someone to turn away from Christ because of our opinions or our preferences? Or what about an otherwise harmless bottle of beer or glass of wine, but you do it in front of someone struggling with alcoholism? Are these things in and of themselves okay? Well, yes, in the same way that food sacrificed to idols was. But Paul is telling us, have some concern for your brothers and sisters in Christ in these matters. And don't be an umphalo skeptic, thinking only of yourself. Think of others that, they, that you may be chasing away from being a Christian by how they see you act as a Christian. So you've heard that line that my right to swing my fist stops somewhere near the end of someone else's nose. Well, for followers of Jesus, my right to swing my fist, my right to eat meat at the Artemis Cafe, my right to put a bumper sticker on screaming my political beliefs ends when my brother and sister in Christ is tripped up by those actions, is driven away from Christ by my words or actions. You see, the unfollow um, skeptic's sin is believing that he lives in a closed system. We don't. We live in a family of brothers and sisters who are, aren't necessarily ones that we would have chosen for ourselves, who may sometimes get under our skin, who sometimes ought to know better than to do what they are doing. But they are still brothers and sisters in Christ for whom Jesus died. Why are we so self-focused? After all, for the most part, belly buttons are quite ugly to stare at. Why would we want to do that? 
our navel gazing, is a result of our sinful human nature to be so self-focused, so self-absorbed. Should we not direct our gaze elsewhere, outward to the others that God has placed in our lives, perhaps? And I believe that the best way to do that is by first directing our eyes towards Christ our Lord. To practice Christoskepsis, gazing at Jesus, even if we have to make up a new word to remind us. Focus our gaze upon the Lord Jesus and all that he has done for us and all that he has asked us to be and do. Focus on God and his people. Do not be lovers of self, but rather be lovers of God and our neighbor, looking outward rather than inward, thinking of others rather than ourselves. Christoskepsis, I submit, is the cure for omphaloskepsis. Gazing at Christ and the marvel of the rescue from sin and death that he earned for us on the cross is what can help us to keep our gaze off of ourselves. Staring at Jesus is much more interesting than staring at your own belly button. That is to say, keeping our focus on Jesus and on our fellow Christians and their needs and their desires and their wants fit more with God's plan for us than thinking only of ourselves. So hopefully now the title of this message makes a little more sense. Christoskepsis, gazing upon Jesus. It's what we do as Christians because we are together to gather Together in Christ, together as people. And friends, in Christ Jesus, God loves you. He loves you very much. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds always on Christ Jesus. Amen. And now the prayer of the church. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh, Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the God of gods and the Lord of lords. Truly there is no God but you alone. For you, from you and from your Son, Jesus Christ, are all things. Reveal this saving knowledge of Christ's truth to us so that we can share it with all the world, that loving you and loving one another, together we may be known by God. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, whose voice was heard at Sinai and whose authority was made manifest in Christ Jesus, the prophet greater than Moses, send faithful preachers into your harvest who will be diligent to listen to your word and speak it faithfully in your name to others. Preserve us from false prophets in this world who would lead us away from your truth and give us ears to hear gladly the saving words of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, guard our families and our homes and build them up in love. Support parents in their task of instructing their children Strengthen those whose faith is weak and make us bold to forego convenience and security to attest to the truths of the most holy faith. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, give health and wisdom to our president and our governor, our legislators and our judges, and all who serve for our governance and protection. Make them high in purpose and wise in counsel unwavering in duty, and faithful always to your word. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son cast out unclean spirits and taught with authority. He is the great physician of body and soul. Have mercy on those who are sick, distressed, 
in danger or facing any particular need. We remember today, especially Judy Thompson, who is recovering from surgery last Thursday, for Barbara Slosser, scheduled for surgery this coming Monday, for Aida McBride and Mariana Steele, and Tom Dewey, who has been hospitalized again. We will remember uh, Carla Rendell's father, Tom Conrad, who was hospitalized with an infection this weekend. We pray healing for all of them and for, uh, at the request of our friends in Soul Lunch, we lift up before you Marilyn and Katie and Judy and Stephanie and Gary and Galena, Fausto and Anna and Lupita and Susan. Dear Lord, you know their needs and we pray your blessings on them. We also remember all who are on our risen Savior prayer list and those who are in our own individual hearts who we now name silently before you. Sustain them all with patience, trusting in your merciful care, and graciously re relieve them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, look with favor on all who partake this day of Christ's true and holy body and blood that is offered in this uh, sacrament, that their eating and drinking may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and renewal of life, and so receive a foretaste of the feast that is to come. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory and honor and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our worship of the Lord includes the bringing of our tithes and offerings for the work of the church here and around the world. If you miss the offering plates on the way in, they can be found at the end of each side aisle on your way out. And now we pray the offertory prayer. Father in heaven, when we consider the gift of your only son, we are embarrassed for the gifts that we are able to bring. Therefore, we pray for faith to give of ourselves more generously to you and to those in need, more like your eternal unsparing love for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I would ask that you stand as you are able as we continue now with the order for the Holy Sacrament beginning with the preface. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and on all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and have given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate of the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet, in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your son Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you of your mercy that you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.